The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So anyway, I'm Chris Babel, and um, as I said, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm the Media Development Director at um, the Office of Digital Learning, which is uh, what the K-12 through video project is part of, as well as MITx and OCW and a bunch of other initiatives on campus. I also teach um, a documentary video class, a science documentary class here at MIT that Elizabeth took uh, a few years ago. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is storytelling, and specifically visual storytelling, and how uh, that can relate or hopefully will relate to the work you do in this class and to online video in general. And I'm going to start out just by um, uh, taking maybe, I don't know if it's exception, but just having a slightly different perspective than something that Elizabeth said. Uh, I, I would say that almost all videos that are successful, almost all viral videos, have some element of a story to them. Even a five second Vine video. Just about everything. And I, I actually was thinking about that and I went looking for what is probably one of the dumbest viral videos to come out uh, recently, just for a few days ago. Um, you may have seen it. This um, is a, a fan at Ohio State who was caught on the Jumbotron, uh, basically scratching her boyfriend's head and then picking her nose. And this thing got, I, I just, it's ridiculous how much play this got in about a 12 hour, 20 hour period. Very ephemeral, you know, it's like absolutely not going to last, it's not going to change anyone's life. But the reason it took off is that it has a story. And the story was created and invented by the people who watched it. it you know, it's not really, yeah, go ahead. So I thought the point of that video, I saw the same thing, yeah. that she was with, that's like, the guy she's seeing on the side. Exactly. Not your boyfriend. That, but it's actually not true. And, and that was a story that was completely created yeah. by people who watched it. Uh, they've been together for a long time, and she didn't even know she was on the Jumbotron, actually, apparently. Um, but it just happens to be this kind of, you know, like, little moment that tells a story. And because it told a story that people related to, suddenly it turned into a giant thing. Um, well, one thing that's hilarious is somebody actually reversed it. So she picks her nose <laughs> and sort of <laughs> leaves a deposit on his neck, and that became another story. There's something disturbing about her facial expression. Yeah, exactly. She looks guilty. She looks guilty. Yeah. And that's why that's part of the story. Like, oh my god, you know, like I've been caught, you know, yeah. rubbing his neck. So anyway, I think this has like got to be the dumbest, you know, uh, viral video of all time. But I think it's also a story. Never think you're not telling a story. If you forget everything else that I say in the next 30, 40 minutes, I would remember this. There's some element of a story in what you do. I don't care if you're making a, an FDA approval video, as, as, as one of you mentioned you were interested in doing, something I have actually done personally. Um, I don't care if you're making a 30 second TV commercial, a 10 second TV commercial, a 12 minute uh, physics demonstration. There is an element of story to it. And it may not be the sort of conventional, traditional, television story that we would see on an HBO show. It may not be a Hollywood movie story, but there is an element of story. And one of the things that you want to do here is find what those elements are. Um, now, you know, let's, let's unpack that a little bit. Let's talk about what is the story and how might it relate to what you're actually going to be doing here. Um, and then secondly, we'll also talk about what are some of the specific techniques of visual storytelling that you might be able to employ. So first of all, what is the story? Well, I, you know, full, full confession, I went to film school and I worked in that sort of ancient medium that, that Elizabeth talked to, television and film. And the classic and traditional way of talking about a story is that it's got these things. It's got a protagonist, you know, a hero. It's got an inciting incident. It's got something that happens that, that sets everything in motion. Then there are barriers along the way, problems that the protagonist has overcome, and then there's a resolution. So that is, you know, you do that in a kind of traditional classic way and you end up with uh, connections or worse, right? It's not going to work, obviously, in the genre that you're talking about. Um, 
Another way of looking at this traditional way is that you know, you've got act one, which is the setup. You've got act two, the barriers, the plot. You've got act three, the resolution. And the, you know, the three act structure is, is kind of the classic kind of screenwriter mode that, that you see over and over again. So how does that relate to what we're actually doing? Well, this is gonna be somewhat repetitive to some of the things Elizabeth talked about. First thing clearly that you need to do in this very short form is engage your audience immediately. I mean, you've got maybe like, you know, five, six seconds, maybe, you know, maybe eight or 10 to engage them on some level. That's the beginning of your story. That's the inciting incident. Uh, and then this is something that I find very interesting. And, and, you know, when I talk about web video, this is something that it's a paradox that I think is, is really, really true. You want to surprise your audience while also showing them exactly what they want to see. And this is really, this is, can be really a challenge. Surprise your audience, in other words, you know, you want to take them somewhere, show them something that's fresh, that's new, that they haven't seen before, something Elizabeth just mentioned. But at the same time, you really want to, you know, you, you need to sort of feed into their expectations because other, otherwise they're going to shut down. Uh, and that is why, uh, you know, a lot of the sort of the, the, the YouTube channels and a lot of the people who do this work for a living uh, have a, a genre that they stick to, you know, uh, Smarter Every Day, ASAP, all of, you know, Vsauce, you know, hey, I always jump up from beneath the frame. <laughs> That's my thing, you know. Uh, so you're showing people what they want at the same time you're surprising them and taking them somewhere they've never been. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a paradox, but I think it's, it's kind of a key paradox. Uh, and then the last thing is leave your audience wanting more. Uh, Shortness, brevity is, is a very important thing. Uh, you know, particularly for, for this, I mean, this is a series, Science Out Loud. You know, the nicest thing for Elizabeth would be if somebody said, oh my God, that was so great. Click, next one. Um, now, if you think about it, this is very similar to a three-act structure. It's just a really compressed three-act structure. Engage your audience, the inciting incident, Surprise your audience and also showing them what they want to see. This is the sort of the development, which might only take 30 seconds. And then leave your audience wanting more. Some kind of resolution that, that takes them to the next thing. Um, the, other, the other element of all of this that's very important to, to, to just briefly mention, and Elizabeth mentioned this earlier, is that in online video, just as we saw with the Ohio State clip, a lot of the storytelling happens outside the frame of your video. And you know you want to basically be able to uh, leverage that. So people's expectations before they see your video play into how they, you know, perceive your story, their experience during, and then what they do after. All of those are part of the story as well. So you know the naked celebrity picture. Well, that's kind of a story too because you know you have an experience of uh, you know Brad Pitt in one context, and then suddenly, wow, is that his butt? That's the story. Not a very good one necessarily, but um, I also want to talk a little bit about protagonists. You know, I started out talking about one of the things you need is a protagonist. Well, on one level, the protagonist is you, if you are the host of this video. And we, you know, if you think about the sort of videos that Elizabeth showed, all of them pretty much on one level or another have a protagonist. It's a very strong character, a very strong protagonist. Whether it's crazy Russian science guy or the smarter everyday sort of you know down home but super smart uh, science guy or um, Vsauce, you know whether love him or hate him, he's a very strong character. Uh, so having a protagonist is really, really, really important, and uh, and that protagonist is going to be you in this particular instance. But there's also another protagonist that we should talk about, and that's your audience. Because what you're doing is taking people on a journey through this learning. And some of the barriers that are gonna be, th be thrown up are barriers to their understanding. Uh, you know, think about, think about Smarter Every Day and that, the, the cat clip. Uh, the whole thing is structured around, oh, hey, we, now we know, it's the tail. Oh, no, it's not, no, it's not, it's something else. And that happens two or three times over the course of the, the clip. That is basically a story. That's storytelling. There's a barrier to understanding, oh, we think we've solved it. No, we haven't. You know, it's like a car chase. It's like you know, breaking into a, a safe. It's like a lot of things that, that you would see in a you know, conventional movie. Um, 
so there are actually kind of, in some ways you can think of it as a dual protagonist. Uh, you, the trusted guide, are taking your buddy, the audience, on this journey, on a story. Um, to return to what I, would sa I said earlier, I, I think of web videos, uh, you know, great web videos are like great snack food. Uh, you, you know, you, they're, they're very familiar, yet they're also sort of spicy and enticing. And after you have one, you just want to have another. You just, and then you have the second one, you just think maybe I should have a third. Um, I don't know if, if you know, hopefully uh, the videos you make won't leave people with, you know, heartburn, which is what happens when you eat too many of these. But, but that is, to me, kind of a, an interesting analogy. And if Interstellar or some three-hour opus that you sit, pay $10 to sit in the dark uh, to watch is a seven-course meal at a four-star restaurant, you're making something that's just got to be really tasty and delightful for just a moment and leave people wanting another one, just exactly like that. But, you know, somehow subtly different, too. All right. Um, I'm not going to show any video because you guys, I'm going to try to just talk about the videos you've already seen rather than show. Um, all right, so let's unpack stories just a little bit more. Um, you know, I've made the case that you're telling a story and you should never forget that you're that you're telling a story when you do this kind of work. Well, what are stories actually built on? There's a whole list of things, and Elizabeth has mentioned a couple of them. Uh, emotion. Now, I mean, I'm not necessarily talking about gone with the wind emotion, uh, but certainly curiosity, identification, uh, humor, which is an, an emotion. All of those things really are, are, are gonna play into what you do and are very, very important. Character, we've, we've talked about character. Conflict, uh, again, not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, high drama, but, but there's often some kind of conflict. And the conflict may be, oh, you thought the cat was using its tail to, to spin. That's not the case. But, um, but some kind of conflict barriers to, to understanding, uh, I think, are very, very important. Spectacle, uh, you know, again, uh, you're not going to do Interstellar. You're not going to uh, spend, you know, $100 million on CGI. You're not going to do The Hobbit. But, but often, take, you know, that, it's another word for taking people a place they've never been. You know, maybe you can get into the nuclear reactor here. Uh, intellectual engagement, I think that's kind of the obvious one, the easy one that we can, uh, that we can all, you know, think about when we're talking about educational videos. Um, and, in and of itself, I don't think it's enough, but it's certainly, it's certainly an important one. And, you know, there are plenty of uh, videos out there, uh, plenty of lecture videos that basically just depend on that. Uh, and then the last two are two of my favorite ones. Uh, the Unfamiliar Becoming Familiar, which is kind of the classic uh, science video, but the Familiar Becoming Unfamiliar as well. In other words, you think you know farts, but you don't. You know, despite all you know about farts, in one context, you don't know that much, and here's why. So I think both of those are, are, are really interesting structures for you to use to hang a story on. You know, the, again, the first one, obviously, you know, I'm going to take this thing that you don't understand, and I'm going to make it completely, uh, you know, I'm going to demystify it. But, you know, a lot of science or science education is also about kind of taking something that seems really simple and showing just how complex and intriguing and unfamiliar it really is. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about visual storytelling because that's obviously what you want to do here. Um, lecture videos, again, intellectual engagement, certainly uh, one way to go. Uh, if you use OCW, as a couple of you have mentioned, you, you, know, you know very well that lecture videos can be effective. And in fact, lectures can be great stories. I mean, we all have had experiences of people who, tell, who, who are great lecturers, who tell great stories. And those stories may or may not be visual. But I think there are certain things that dis distinguish visual storytelling that are worth uh, talking about. Um, and this is a concept that um, I often use uh, to just kind of get into to this whole idea which Elizabeth will probably remember. Um, and this is what 
what we sometimes call the plastic elements of video or of film. And sometimes I use film and video indistinguishably because, um, you know, betrays my age. Uh, you know, video is film, film is video now at this point. Um, what I mean by the plastic elements of, of video are just simply all of the things that we have control over when we make a video. And that, that could be the casting of the actors, it could be where we put the camera, that's kind of the obvious one, uh, the lighting. Uh, there's an, an endless list of things. And in fact, here are just a few of them. Um, again, you know, most people would list the camera right away since that's kind of you know, the paintbrush, quote unquote. Uh, the lighting, how we choose to light something or whether we're actually using, literally using lights or just using the sun or existing room lights. Editing, sound, music, characters, the actors, locations, props, costumes. The list is really endless. It's really, it goes back to the decisions. You know, Elizabeth mentioned decision making. All of these things are things you need to think about and you can control. And they can work for you or, or they can work against you. Um, you know, think about in uh, Smarter Every Day, props. The cat itself, of course, is a great prop. Think about the stuffed cat at the beginning, which is that sort of fun moment of, oh my God, he's really gonna drop a real cat. Um, so he, you know, that was a choice. That was a choice to, to add that stuffed cat and it sort of made a fun little moment that, that brought you in uh, for just a second. Locations, very, very important. I mean, you know, the sort of lowest common denominator location is a chalkboard or a whiteboard for something like, you know, for an educational video. But there are all sorts of other possibilities. Uh, costumes, again, doesn't have to be, you know, clown costumes or silly hats or things like that, although it could be. Uh, but all of the other things that you can or, or might be able to bring to your video by making these choices. Um, camera, of course, is, 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 is a crucial one, and I'm going to unpack that just a little bit uh, as well, although we could spend, of course, hours talking about, about uh, film grammar. Um, so I'm going to just go through a few other tips to think about. Um, the first one, and this is kind of like, you know, the, the Bible uh, of, of visual storytelling, show, don't tell. And um, it sounds kind of obvious, but it isn't necessarily that easy to do. Um, if, you, if we think about the, um, the sleep video, I think one of the things that, that I responded to in that video um, that, I, that I thought could have been better is that it's actually not showing us much. It's telling us. The, the, you know, Elizabeth talked about the, the, sort of the fact that the, the voiceover just read like a, a, a web article, like a sort of, you know, 10 facts about sleep. And that's basically the case. I mean, there are some really cool animation, and the animation is fun, and it helps, and it definitely supports the words. But together, it's really just, you know, this thing, you know, I could have listened to it on my iPod. I could have listened to it in my car. Uh, the, video, the visuals helped a little bit, but it didn't really add anything to it. Um, the, the, you know, the other way to do it, of course, is uh, Smarter Every Day, which, you know, you know, again, you may or may not have liked that. You may have thought that it, it dragged on too long, and I agree with that, certainly. I think there were things that could have been improved, but there's nothing like dropping a cat and showing it in super slow motion to, you know, get my attention. Um, so I think, I think that was a great example of showing something. Um, so <laughs> this is just something I wanted to mention. Um, having worked on, uh, you know, in television, uh, there was a, 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 just a saying that, that went around a lot um, when people were talking about a script, which was, uh, oh, this is kind of a wolf pack deal. And what was meant by that, this was sort of an infamous situation from, I don't know, God knows when, uh, somebody who's scripting a nature documentary had written this, you know, long, pro you know, very beautiful kind of flowery narration about, you know, the, the, the ravenous pack loped across the frozen tundra in search of its prey, blah, 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 you know, like two pages of sort of beautiful prose. And, you know, at some point in, in you know, in the editing process, somebody was like, <laughs> because they had, you know, that. They didn't need to say all of that stuff. All they had, they had, you know, the picture was worth endless amounts of stuff. So, you know, avoid your wolf pack moments. 
if you don't need to say something, you can show it. There may be plenty of things to say, and I'm not saying that you know, it should be all visual, but, but you don't need to say certain things if you're already showing those things. Use your language, use your words, which are very important, to do other things, to reinforce, to bring your own perspective, to, to embellish the story, to you know, bring people into your own mind, your own character. You don't need to say the obvious stuff. You don't need to you know, do the wolf pack description. Um, so that's show, don't tell. The other thing uh, that's just a sort of a fundamental tip is video loves motion. Moving pictures, people, you know, and, and Josh is gonna talk about storyboarding and animation later in the week. Uh, clearly, animated pictures, moving things, things that reveal one thing or another in animation are, you know, it's really important. Same with cameras. Uh, you know, if you look at Science Out Loud, some of the other episodes, you'll see some really terrific moves with the camera, dollies. Um, all of those things add, add visual interest and improve your storytelling. Locking down a tripod can also be very effective, but again, think of it as a plastic element that you can control. Don't do it just because you didn't think about it. Do it after thinking about what you're doing by either moving or not moving. So why, so the camera loves motion. Um, this, is, this is kind of the corollary to that, and I don't know if, if people have a lot of shooting experience or not, and this isn't really strictly a class on you know, the technique, production techniques, but um, this is something I really wanted to mention. Motion for the sake of motion is also not terrific, not fantastic. Uh, hosing down the room is that sort of tendency that your uncle or your grandfather has when you give him a camera to just do this all the time. And you're going like, oh, hey, I'm getting everything. I'm just getting everything here. This is fantastic. And in fact, what you get is absolutely nothing because there's, there's no intentionality. There's no sort of thought to what's happening with the camera. All you're doing is making everybody seasick and really pissed that you're not focusing on anything. Um, motion is actually, uh, I think a, a better way to talk about it in story terms is reveals. When you're moving things, you're revealing the next story element. So if I pan from our camera person over to Josh, and Josh is looking over at the camera person and is going like, why is he doing what he's doing? That's a story element. Whereas if I do this, I'm not telling a story at all. Uh, same with animation, and I'm sure Josh thinks about this night and day. I mean, how do you reveal your next thing from the thing you've got? How do you go from this idea to that idea? How do you reveal using motion? Because it is moving pictures. So, um, so that's maybe a, ma a more pointed way of talking about, about motion in a story, in story terms, revealing things. Uh, I'm going to talk a little, just a little tiny bit about um, grammar and framing and, and stuff like that very quickly. Um, this is uh, just a still from an interview that I did a, a couple of years ago here at MIT, Joel Dawson, professor uh, here. And just a couple of things to just point out about it in terms of sort of visual, um, uh, just the way visually it's set up. First of all, uh, y you'll see that, that the, the background and the foreground are very distinct. Um, we shot it so that the background is completely out of focus. And that's so that you know what to focus on. Uh, you, wh that's the other thing. So we talked about reveal. The other, the other sort of key crucial thing to think about when you're storyboarding or creating animation or directing is how do you get people to look at what you want them to look at in the frame. One way is to foreground the foreground and let the background drop off, either through lighting or through the focus in this case, uh, or through art direction. There are all sorts of ways to do it, uh, but, but doing it is really important. Uh, the other thing is that this is a close-up. Sounds kind of simple, sounds kind of obvious, but it's making a choice to go in and to find out about this guy, this person. It's not about the lab. 
it's not just sort of this wishy-washy moving shot of him sort of wandering around his lab doing something. We want to hear what this person is saying, what he's thinking right now. Um, just another quick thing to, to just talk about. Um, when you're shooting uh, in this particular format, 16, 16 by 9, there are a couple of really powerful parts of the frame that you can use, whether you're doing animation or shooting. And they tend to be the, where uh, the, the thirds cross each other. So that's a very powerful part of the frame. That's also powerful. Um, these are powerful in slightly different ways. And you'll see his eye is like dead, dead on in the, the crosshairs. Um, if we're uh, people who you know, are, are read left to right, you know, who uh, in sort of you know, the Euro, European uh, tradition of writing, this tends to be the most powerful point because we read frames left to right, because we're used to, our eyes are used to going that way. Uh, not saying you'd have to follow this rule, you can break it, but it's just an interesting thing for you to, to know that when you're framing things, when you're creating animations, um, you know, there's a tendency when you start to think, oh, dead center would be really great, but it's actually not the case. Uh, a little off center and in, in the sort of the thirds of the frame is, is a good way to go. Um, the other thing just to talk about quickly in terms of making choices, uh, think about when you, and, and this, will, this will really come up when you work through your storyboarding exercises with Josh, uh, think about what, what the kinds of shots you, you choose are doing. Um, wide shots say one thing, close-ups say another. Uh, starting with a wide shot and coming in, that's a reveal of something. But coming, starting in a close-up and going wide can also be a reveal of something else. And, you know, we can both, we, I think we can imagine um, what kinds of stories might come out of these two frames and how the story might be different if we started here and went in here and if we started here and came out. Um, so make choices and think about what your choices are actually going to do in terms of the story. Another example of that, uh, camera angles, framing. Low angles looking up, that gives you a certain feeling. It gives you a, a certain kind of power, you know, sort of, uh, you know, master of my domain feel. Uh, the opposite looking down, kind of the opposite. Uh, this, these are just two examples, and I'm not going to go on and on and on and talk about, about uh, others, although we may get into it later in the week. Uh, but the point, the point is, is that the camera is kind of one of the key plastic elements that you have at your disposal to tell your story. And the medium shot, just kind of center frame, you know, doing your thing, is kind of the fallback. You don't have to do that. There are any number of other choices you can make. And uh, when you start to go and choose locations, and choose props, and choose elements like that, how you shoot those things and how you shoot your characters becomes very, very, very important. Um, and then the last thing that I'm going to talk about, and I'm kind of racing through this because I want to just make sure we have time for questions and stuff. Um, I'm just going to be a little counterintuitive. We've been talking about visual storytelling, but just don't, don't shortchange your sound. Sound is often more important than the picture. And one of the other things that I think, um, you know, we talked to, uh, Elizabeth talked a little bit about, about production technique and sort of, you know, quote unquote bad technique or rough videos versus, versus slicker kind of TV style videos. One thing that's very, very, very hard to overcome is poor sound. And even if your video is a little out of focus and it's shaky, if it's really compelling, that's fine as long as the sound is good. But as soon as the sound is bad and hard to listen to, you're going to have a really hard time pulling people back. So we, you know, we, even though this is mostly about visual storytelling, I just want to point that out, that that doesn't mean that the sound is not important. In fact, the sound is extraordinarily important. And um, it's a, you know, both a technical thing, but also a plastic element that you can use, whether it's music or sound effects. Uh, or the way you treat dialogue, all of those things are, are really important. Um, so anyway, so just to contextualize this a little bit, I know that uh, Elizabeth co-instructor George is going to be doing uh, 
a workshop, a scripting workshop with you, and he's going to be focusing a lot on finding your voice, which is really, really important and goes back to the idea of character and, you know, the protagonist and authenticity and all of the, a lot of the things Elizabeth was talking about. But as you do that, as you do all of those things, remember that ultimately you're telling a visual story and that you, once you sort of hone your, your story, hone your voice, you want to put that in a visual context. You don't have to have the words carry everything. And in fact, the words may end up um, doing other things than conveying kind of the, the core of what you need to do. Um, so that's it. I kind of tried to race through it because I didn't want to um, keep, th keep people for too long. But um, first of all, any, any questions or, th or thoughts? I just had a thought, yeah. you know, it's a question. Um, it was interesting. Um, you mentioned that the, um, sorry, the name's escaping me, the whiteboard video that, that you were critiquing earlier. That, I'm sorry. Oh, the ASAP science, yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, I, I liked it. I didn't mean to, you no, know, no, dump no, on I it. But it was really important, yeah. a really interesting point. And, I, and so then I was thinking, okay, what would have been more effective? You mm -hmm. know, uh, what, what, how could that have been turned into some sort of more storytelling um, exercise or something that was more engaging? And I, you know, um, I think it would be an interesting question. Mm -hmm. You know, just how could that be made better? And my, my, my feeling was, would it be better to um, do something where you actually had someone not sleep for overnight or for two days? Well, I think Almost. that's, yeah, oh, sorry. yeah no, go, no, go ahead, yeah. You yeah. know, something like um, Super Size Me, mm -hmm. you know, where you have someone actually engage in this thing and, and, and it's more experiential as opposed to being didactic, I guess would be the, 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 yeah. the distinction there. So well, that was just one idea. I think yeah. that's a really good point. I think. Um, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the smarter everyday approach, which um, yeah. I respond to personally better. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, I think that there are graphics that tell amazing stories. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, data visualizations uh, that I've seen recently in particular are just can be an extraordinary storytelling uh, sort of, you know, devices. Yeah. And so, so it's not so much that I think that it was animated and somehow that was you know, not as effective. Right. It's that I think the process was write script yeah. and then come up with sort of stuff to fill in space. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so yeah, I personally respond more to the, the ones that are more experiential where you have, a, you have people you know, that may also be supported by animation, but there is kind of a, there is someone taking you through the experience. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think that, that there are lots and lots of ways to tell really, really dynamic and really interesting good stories with animation. So. Yeah. That's good to hear for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, totally. I mean, I, and you know, I mean, I mean I, we've all been there. I've been there too. I mean, you have something that you have to make come alive and I think they did a great job of making it come alive. I think the animation is, was really effective. Yeah. It's just that I think it, the approach was to write, to, to write a script without necessarily thinking about the visual medium, and then to take the visuals and layer them on top as a separate part of the process. Right. So. Um, so anybody else have any? I mean, I, again, I know I kind of raced through it. Um, How many people, I mean, do you have video experience? How many people have some kind of video experience? It's always a really good question to ask. No? Nobody? <laughs> well, that's cool. That's great. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, just to, just to um, go back a little bit, I mean, I think that whole relationship between web video and TV is a really interesting one. It's a really interesting one to unpack. Um, because again, the sort of conventional storytelling techniques that, that we're used to seeing on TV are not going to be effective for all sorts of reasons. Um, you know, it's also worth mentioning that, of course, TV has changed too radically since Connections. I mean, uh, 
you know, Game of Thrones doesn't open that way. You know, you know two minutes of sort of somebody wandering around a house. Um, but, but at the same time, it is a different, it is a different uh, genre. And a, a really a crucial thing is kind of the thing that Elizabeth alluded to and I mentioned at the beginning, that I think you're telling a story, but your story extends beyond the bounds of your video or can extend beyond the bounds of your video. It, it basically can begin with what people's preconceptions are before they start watching and it continues on after the video is, is done. Uh, and I think that is a really crucial difference. One, one suggestion that I would make, um, you know, whenever you write something this week and you know, you're going to be writing treatments and pitches and scripts, um, think about it in purely visual terms. I mean, one of, the, you know, one of the early exercises that I had to do when I was in grad school uh, were silent films and films that, you know, or versions of scripts that had no dialogue, had no sound at all. And I think that's, I'm not saying that you should do that as a, as a, as a technique in your finished piece, but it's a way of bringing up stuff that you can then apply to your video later. So, you know, if you were going to do something that was purely visual, that was going to convey what you wanted to convey, how would you do it? And what might you sort of create or invent or think about uh, through that process that you could then use to inform your script? So just a, just a, a way of thinking about what you're, what you're going to be doing this week.